I'm Dennis Anderson along with Julie Zenner and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. The St. Louis County Board voted this week to ban e-cigarettes in public places. It's the latest effort to rein in so-called vaping of liquid nicotine and other substances. Tourism officials are expecting another banner year for visitors in the region with an estimated annual economic impact of $800 million. It's big business for the leaders of Visit Duluth. And we'll have the latest business headlines and watch a news file story from 25 years ago. So stay right where you are. Almanac North is next. Hello and welcome to Almanac North. Thank you very much for watching. This week's program was recorded on Wednesday afternoon. And now here's Julie to introduce our first topic. All right, thank you, Denny, and welcome everyone. Beginning July 1st, smoking e-cigarettes in or near public buildings in St. Louis County will be banned. The ordinance mirrors similar bans already passed in seven other Minnesota counties and 23 cities, including Duluth, Hermantown, and Ely. Electronic cigarettes have grown in popularity since smoking tobacco in public buildings was outlawed. But opponents say vaping is unhealthy and normalizes a behavior many have worked very hard to denormalize. Joining us now is Patrick Boyle, the St. Louis County Commissioner who carried the ordinance. And Pat McCone is Director of Tobacco Control Programs and Policy for the American Lung Association. And welcome. We thank both of you for being here today. Pat McCone, mm -hmm. you brought some examples of e-cigarettes with you. And I, I think it would be interesting for some of our viewers to actually hear a little bit more about what they are and how they work. Because okay. it's a relatively new phenomenon. Uh, relatively new. So we'll um, just, the ones I have here are called sigalikes because mm -hmm. they look like cigarettes, um, exactly like cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the challenges. So basically they're a, a battery component. There is a liquid cartridge in here and an atomizer that uh, aerosolizes the yeah. liquid. So it's, I'm not going to smoke it for <laughs> you, but it's inhaled on that ignites the uh, battery to heat the liquid and then the liquid is aerosolized. You inhale it and then it's vaping out this aerosol. And, you know, if I were holding this and somewhere, people would have a hard time telling if this yeah. was a real cigarette or not. Does it heat not. up or not? It does heat up. It, it does. doesn't heat on the outside. It's okay. a lithium battery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, this is a disposable one. There are also ones that are called mods or tanks where you act, they're actually refillable and have many, many different flavors okay. that appeal to young people. So when you take a drag on it, is, mm -hmm. is that what it's, it starts the life of the... The battery? Yes. Or? Yeah, the battery heats up then, uh, that, that um, so action you don't, you turns don't it on. So you don't physically light it? Uh, like you no, you don't light it at all. Tobacco nope, nope. Some of them have a little button that you press and oh. then that heats the battery. And I'm amazed at how heavy that is. It's much, <laughs> yeah. much heavier than yes. a regular cigarette. Yeah, and we haven't even talked about the pollution of disposable um, that this would bring about. But that's yeah. what one looks like. Here's another smaller version of the same cigalike, a little mm -hmm. smaller. Yeah. But um, Can definitely. you talk about that disposal? Where, where, where are they tossed? Um, these are tossed in the garbage. That's where they're tossed. Hopefully not on the street or in sewers, but they are they are tossed away. They are, as they say, a disposable, equal to about two packs of cigarettes. Costs a little under twelve dollars for mm -hmm. them, and uh, it's a it's an ingenious nicotine delivery <laughs> system that. Uh, for many of these cigalike products, it's the tobacco industry mm -hmm. who manufactures them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, the the nicotine itself, uh, as I understand, is not what causes cancer in, in smoking cigarettes. Um, is the vapor that comes off of these e-cigarettes, is does that have carcinogens in it? I think studies are still underway regarding mm -hmm. that. The uh, uh, FDA is, is, is working through that process. Mm -hmm. So we don't know. You know, there's over 300 varieties, uh, all with different uh, 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 potions of what's inside of them. So we don't, mm -hmm. we don't really know. But uh, there's been multiple uh, uh, studies that have been showing that, that there's carcinogens in them. Mm -hmm. uh, 
any other? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's the Wild West. There are no regulations over these. You could go out to my trunk of my car and do a little potion and sell it and say it's e-juice. Mm -hmm. There's absolutely no quality control, mm -hmm. nothing over these um, devices or the liquid that's, that's inhaled out of them. Patrick, so, why did the okay. county board take on the issue? Uh, you know, I was able to take part on two sides of this. Uh, two years ago, I was on the Duluth City Council. Uh, we were the first uh, city in, in the state of Minnesota to, to push us forward uh, of banning uh, e-cigarettes in public spaces. Uh, since then, being the guinea pig of Duluth, uh, Hermantown and Ely uh, moved on and had the same ordinances passed. So basically, 99,000 out of our 200,000 constituents in St. Louis County already have this standard. Uh, it's worked really well. Our police chief, uh, Gordon Ramsey, was quoted. I had a direct quote from him showing that uh, it's been enforceable, that he's had no issues with it whatsoever the last two years. So I thought it was time to bring it to the, the rest of the constituents of St. Louis County. Mm -hmm. Pat, is the American Lung Association pushing for some sort of regulation? You, mm -hmm. you mentioned that it is kind of like the Wild West mm -hmm. out there. Are you pushing for regulation or are you pushing for outright banning of this technology? Well, we're pushing hard at the federal level for mm -hmm. the FDA to govern these devices. Um, they originally entered the market as, quote, smoking cessation devices, and it was actually the e-cigarette industry who took FDA to court and said, we are not cessation devices, we're tobacco products. So we're pushing hard for that. And we're also very, very concerned about the rapid increase of use of these devices by children. Mm -hmm. Are yeah. e-cigarettes addictive? It, they contain nicotine, nicotine, they are addictive, yes. A s very small amount of nicotine, less nicotine than in tobacco? per cigarette? Not necessarily. I was at a nicotine research conference a couple of weeks ago and there was actually a study showing that some of these devices deliver more nicotine than combustible cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And nicotine is the, other than heroin, it's the most addictive drug there is. Is there any upside to the e-cigarettes from a, a health perspective, either in terms of actually helping smokers quit? Because there were some smokers at, at the county mm -hmm. board who, who said that this has been a tool for them to quit smoking, mm -hmm. um, or the fact that there are perhaps fewer mm -hmm. toxins in them than regular cigarettes. If you're going to smoke, is this a better alternative? Yeah, I guess is my question. I, I think we can't set a public health standard of something that's less hazardous than the number one product that kills more Americans than anything else. The verdict is out long term. We have not seen a generation that has inhaled glycerin yeah. and flavorings and nicotine for a lifetime. So I would, you know, if people have used them and got off of combustibles, congratulations. Next step, get off of these devices. So the county board has prohibited now the smoking of e-cigarettes in public places. What constitutes a public place? A uh, public place uh, can be where you work uh, on a daily basis. Uh, it can be restaurants, it can be pubs, uh, anywhere where, uh, you know, involving the Clean Indoor Air Act. How about outside? Are there places c considered public places where you can't smoke outdoors? Uh, I, I think that goes with the rules of w the building. Uh, some places 20 feet away. Walking uh, down the street this does not correct. constitute public place Correct for, for non-smoking? Correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the arguments at the at the county uh, was mm -hmm. that vaping sends mixed signals to, to young people. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? I, uh, it's the new trend out. Where uh -huh. The studies are just showing that even in the last uh, six months that uh, uh, kids aren't using traditional uh, uh, nicotine as much uh, uh, smoking, but they are using the e-cigarettes. Uh, it's going through the roof. Uh, so we're seeing the epidemic going at that level. and. Uh, we want to show as a county and as cities that uh, this is this is not where you want to go as as uh, addicted to the nicotine. Mm -hmm. Commissioners Tom Rukavina and Chris Dahlberg did not vote in favor of uh, banning e-cigarettes. Right. Did that surprise you? Uh, you know, no. I, I, I commissioner, especially Commissioner Rukavina, has always been very consistent on tobacco and and, and alcohol uh, through his years in the legislature. Uh, one of the other uh, legs of this walking uh, ordinance was. Uh, the use of vape uh, to, to be able to sample in, in e-cigarette stores, uh -huh. uh, which is to, to us unenforceable. You, can, you can't enforce it. Uh, what was happening is these stores were uh, uh, letting folks in for hours on hours. They were having uh, uh, rock bands come to their stores. Uh, they were having Viking games on the big screen TV, even church services on Sunday. So they were open all day. Uh, and you can't, uh, you can't put a timeline on when folks are going to be in and out of there. So mm -hmm. that was the other part of the Clean Indoor Act that we debated. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't a concern on your part about the negative impact on, on the businesses that sell these products? 
No, I don't think so. We, we actually have a place that's been open for the last two years in Duluth. Uh, has been under the, the City of Duluth's ordinance and is, is running. Mm -hmm. There were actually two in Duluth when the policy passed and a third has opened. So, uh, you know, the vast majority of e-cigarettes are actually ordered online where you don't sample. E-cigarettes, yeah. are they manufactured by <coughs> tobacco companies that's, who sell regular tobacco products? Uh, these Sigalikes are, absolutely. Altria, which is Philip Morris, has a brand. R.J. Reynolds has a brand. And Lorillard has a brand. The biggest uh, one is seller is Blue, where you've seen some of the movie stars um, mm -hmm. touting these. It brings us back to the 50s and 60s, <laughs> yeah. Danny. Did uh, they <laughs> buy these companies when these e-cigarette yes. firms were in their infancy? Yes, they bought some of them. There, there have been takeovers. I mean, these are, what I, my fear is that these are starter products. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have, there's an appeal to a whole level of young people that would never consider smoking. Mm -hmm. But with the image of these aren't as bad. Technology hmm. keeps changing. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. maybe 15, 20, 30 years from now, mm -hmm. e-cigarettes will be a thing of the past and there'll be something else coming on. Yes, uh, no doubt. People like habits. Mm -hmm. They latch onto habits. Um, mm -hmm. it, will that, do they always have to have nicotine? Do you think is there something else going to come down the pike? That uh, well, we saw when, with you know with our, with the air issue in Duluth with the synthetic uh, uh, marijuana mm -hmm. issues. There you go. Uh, it's going to the, the industries are going to continue to adapt to, to regulations, and uh, it's going to be uh, a fight that uh, you know uh, my father led in the legislature. I'm leading now. Mm -hmm. My daughters will, uh, I think, in their lifetimes, it, it will continue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pat, you've been mm -hmm. in this business for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, led a lot of efforts mm -hmm. uh, against tobacco. Mm -hmm. As you look at how far society and, and our culture has come, mm -hmm. A lot of progress, you feel, has has been made on that front. Oh my people? gosh, yes. I mean, I I remember the fight over airplanes, and you if you <laughs> light, light up a cigarette on an airplane, now they land it. So a lot <laughs> has changed. Um, but these devices, these really have me concerned. They really mm -hmm. do. The acceptability among young people, that alarming increase, the unregulation, and mm -hmm. I, this is very concerning and could take us many decades to mm -hmm. backwards. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are you also kind of keeping an eye on what's happening with recreational <coughs> marijuana because that's potentially coming down the line too? Um, oh, as an organization we definitely are. Um, I think it's you know another, I mean what we recommend you inhale is clean air and anything else of course is is something your lungs just don't like. Between the two yeah. sexes and yeah. age groups, what's who's smoking more today than ever before? Uh, that's a great question. It's almost equal. It's young people, actually 18 to age, 18 to 34. More have women some of the than men, or not necessarily. Uh, no, it's almost equal. A little okay. more women than men. Very concerning age group. A lot for of advertising women. used to be geared toward women. It's actually some populations, and I will say those with mental illness and substance abuse are yeah. smoking at the highest levels. All right. Well, thank you yeah. so much for coming in, educating yeah. us about the e-cigarettes. Great, and, great discussion. Uh, thank discussion. you. Thank you. Now, let's dig into our News File archive for a look at what was making news 25 years ago this week. Duluth's true ship is finally coming in. It's the summer tourist season, a time for the city to extend its first official welcome to warm weather visitors. It's beautiful. It really is. There's a lot to see. The lakes seem like they're clean and, and uh, just a big area and we just seen a ship come in that was most interesting and seeing the bridge go up and never seen that before mm -hmm. today's season attraction opener is offering discounts prizes and museum passes to encourage people to get out and enjoy the twin ports sights and sounds so far business has been good down by the harbor we've had a quite a steady supply of visitors uh, they seem to know about it and they are real interested in our attractions and so we've been steering them that way and uh, the Zoomobile is down here. Um, the cruises are going out. And I think it's going to be a good start to the tourist season. In connection with the weekend's promotions of tourism, the Lake Superior Zoological Gardens is taking to the road with a Zoomobile. And the animals on wheels are giving the zoo some valuable but relatively inexpensive advertising. And with 1.5 million visitors expected to make Duluth part of their summer plans, 
City tourist officials hope today's big start will be a sign of things to come. Ryan Davenport, KDLH News. Memorial Day weekend marks the traditional beginning of the summer tourism season here in the Northland. Recent research from Visit Duluth, the city's official destination marketing organization, shows about 3.5 million annual visitors to the region. Now those visitors spend an estimated $800 million and support some 16,000 jobs. So what's on tap this summer for tourism? Joining us now is Anna Tansky, the president and CEO of Visit Duluth. Anna, welcome. Wow, $800 million. We're talking That's big, a big, big financial money. impact. It really is. This is the third largest industry in our region. So for us, it's quite significant. Mm -hmm. Do most, let me put it this way, do more tourists visit Duluth than other tourist sites in the state? Well, you know, I don't know exactly what the other um, regions draw because we really focus on our own area, but we are definitely the high point for all of northeastern Minnesota, sort of the gateway to this region. And we really like to collaborate with our neighbors to encourage vis visitors to stay longer and explore all of the area. So as long as Duluth gets in there, we love it when they jump off and go to visit the Boundary Waters or head up the North Shore or head to the Iron Range. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now we mentioned that Memorial Day is kind of the traditional start, but is this year's season off, uh, uh, off and running a little bit earlier with the, the early snow melt and the relatively mild spring? You know, it has been a really strong start to the year for us. Wow. And it really, we started to see it at the end of last year in December, we had a record breaking month. So that led into the first quarter of the year and the momentum continued. So we're really anticipating a very, very strong summer season and the weather does come into play though. Yeah. It is a factor no matter how much yeah. we'd like to think that's not the case. That was my does. next question, <laughs> Anna. Now we've been experiencing a week or so of, you know, cold weather. It's a little gloomy. <laughs> it's and, a little uh, gloomy. You know, and Duluth does have cold springs and often quite wet. Um, mm -hmm. Does that make people who are planning a trip to Duluth nervous at all about the weather changing? Well, I think there can be some hesitation, but what we really try to share in our marketing message is that we are a four season destination. And so it's not just the beautiful summer and it's not just our fabulous active winters. We do have spring and fall that um, bring the shoulder seasons as we call them. But you know, Duluth is a city that is equipped to handle this kind of weather. So whether it's gloomy or rainy or lake wind or what have you, we have fantastic attractions that are, you know, mm -hmm. indoor attractions. We have our wonderful skywalk system and we really are a walkable city even when it is a little crummy outside. What are the main markets that you're targeting? Mm -hmm. Well, our research that we just did last year, so um, it was it was needed to tell us more sure. about our visitors. We learned that 66% of our visitors are coming from the Twin Cities um, okay. directly and that nine out of 10 are driving here from within a 100 to 300 mile radius. So what that tells us is we have a great opportunity to promote and advertise mm -hmm. in the Twin Cities like we do, but we expanded and we tried new markets like um, Thunder Bay, which our neighbors to the north, we know our Canadian friends love to come and do a little retail here in Duluth. And Fargo-Moorhead has been a huge new market for us that we have just entered into yeah. in the last year, along with Eau Claire, Wisconsin, and now Des Moines this year. You just year. mentioned Fargo. A couple of years ago, I was down at Park Point, and there was, well, I was overhearing some people from North Dakota, and uh, their, their exclamation was, wow, an ocean. They had never <laughs> been to Duluth before. Absolutely. And what we learned about our North Dakota visitors in general is they stay longer because they have a little longer journey to get here. It's not the easy trek just up I-35, when the Twin City residents come up here to play. So they actually tend to extend their stay, which of course is music to all of our ears. Are there new market segments or types of visitors that you're looking at these days that maybe have mm -hmm. changed in recent years? We really are. Um, you know, 
we have had the traditional markets that do well for us, which are typically family-based or kind of the romantic getaway. And we really wanted to expand into other areas. So the gay and lesbian market has become a new focus for us that is really, um, and those are families as well as romantic getaways. So it's still messaging the same way, but reaching out in new ways, mm -hmm. along with destination weddings, which are becoming more and more popular. And you don't have to go to Mexico or the Caribbean to have <laughs> one of those. You can come right here. So we are looking at new ways to reach out to new market segments. Yes. We've seen a plethora of new hotels being built in and around Duluth. What are hotel uh, owners looking mm -hmm. for in this city when they consider building here? Well, I just took a call today from another one that's looking in this area. And um, because there is so much going on in Duluth, but at the same time, it's 365 days a year when you're trying to fill 4,000 plus hotel rooms. We're closer to 4,800 within our whole region, which is a lot considering our small demographic area. And so we work very hard to try to keep those hotels as busy as we can. But the owners are really looking at the fact that Duluth's reputation and the brand that we work so hard to market has become very popular and so there is a draw even though we still work very hard to get those visitors here Duluth is becoming more known which makes it a much more attractive market when they're looking to develop a new property and part of that are, are big national exposures such as the outside magazine absolutely and being named the the top outdoor city how has that translated into um, what you're doing mm -hmm. in marketing and the number of people that are inquiring or actually coming here? Well, we learned that outdoor recreation is one of the top draws mm -hmm. to the area. And it's not just for um, maybe the hardcore enthusiasts, you know, the, the real intense mountain bikers or mm -hmm. the extreme experiences. These really are visitors who are coming to maybe go on a hike or check out, you know, a, a natural, one of our natural regions. And that's why the development of the St. Louis River Corridor mm -hmm. with the half and half um, mm -hmm. lodging tax and the restaurant tax is really going to help us expand on those natural offerings that are such a draw and outside magazines um, designation really yeah. has just been that launching point for us and we really are trying to capitalize on that message and we're actually taking that message internationally and um, Europe it's no secret has been you know decades ahead of the US on hiking and bicycling of course and so we just this year are partnering with a company based in Belgium that is marketing what we have here to European visitors for hiking and bicycling well, that's to, to draw them here, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you market in other areas, Fargo, Moorhead, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Eau Claire, Wisconsin, what message are you telling the people who live there? You know, we try to be very respectful and play off of words um, that will resonate with them. So in the Twin Cities, when we show an outdoor billboard that says high rise, we're showing a an aerial lift bridge image or a board meeting is the saying, and then we show the boardwalk. And our message is reality is different in Duluth. And so even for communities like Eau Claire, which aren't a mega metropolitan area, we're trying to showcase what we have that they don't have and entice them to come here. And it has to be that emotional response. Sure. It's working, apparently. I, I think it's working really well so far. <laughs> I also read an article that you had written about how important the quality of service is. Absolutely. Here. And to that experience as visitors come and whether mm -hmm. they decide to come back and recommend it. Well, Talk and you know, that. in the age of social media, a lot of what you see posted besides the beautiful pictures, which is just free promotion that we really, really are so appreciative of, it is the service and it is the overall experience is what people are sharing about in a positive yeah. or a negative way. And so we do work very diligently along with our partners in the attraction side of things to offer customer service training for yeah. the frontline staff because it mm -hmm. is so vitally important that we set ourselves apart by giving that ultimate visitor experience. Just to follow up on that, do first impressions have a a determination maybe if somebody will come back? Absolutely. You know, we have learned over the years that because we are so close to the Twin Cities, for example, people have an established tradition of coming here or they come here because they grew up coming here as children and now they bring their own family here. And if we don't maintain that, you know, and service that level of expectation, we won't get them back here again. And we need, we can't be complacent. Mm -hmm. We really need to be proactive. We just have a few more seconds, but what are the big things coming up this summer that people might want to be looking out for? You know, there's a fantastic lineup at Bayfront Festival Park, mm -hmm. tremendous entertainment options there, along with our key signature events, starting with Grandma's Marathon, heading through to the Blues Fest, and of course, 4th of July as well. 
And away we go. <laughs> and here we go. <laughs> and, and we, have to, we have to say goodbye to you at this point, too. Anna Tansky, Visit Duluth. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great job. It's time now for a look at the week's business stories from Business North. The financial reorganization of magnetation could be good long-term news for the area, but it will come with a cost for vendors and others who did business with the firm before its Chapter 11 filing. The unsecured creditors can only hope they'll be repaid for some or all of the products or services they've provided. Bankruptcy documents show Magnetation owes nearly $33 million to its top 20 creditors, eight of which are in northeastern Minnesota. All told, the regional companies are owed $12.6 million, with seven due more than $1 million each. How, they'll, how much they'll receive won't be known until later in the bankruptcy action. Grand Itasca Clinic and Hospital will cut about 15 positions in response to the declining reimbursement it receives for medical services, in particular Medicaid, which pays about 50% of costs. Chief Executive Mike Yuso said the Affordable Care Act and regional economic factors are the problem nationwide. And he said declining reimbursements nationwide and increased regulation are forcing independent health care groups like Grand Itasca into consolidations and mergers. That's something advocates of Obamacare had predicted. Yuso said more people are insured, but they are insured through programs that don't completely cover hospital and clinic costs. Elite Incorporated had another strong year and will have a strong future. That's according to President and CEO Al Hodnick at Tuesday's corporate annual meeting. Net income rose 10 percent, operating revenue increased 12 percent, and the corporation's dividend climbed 3.1 percent. Hodnick stressed that the company is more balanced, sustainable, and agile as the result of recent acquisitions and strategic initiatives. For more on these and other stories, visit businessnorth.com. Leave a comment on our show while there's still time. Dial 218-788-2849 to reach our answering system or send an email to almanacnorth at wdsc.org. And don't forget the WDSC website is a great place to get program updates and find out what is happening at your public television station. Memorial Day weekend just over a week away, Julie, and the barbecue and yard work season also here. It's already underway at our place. I've seen mosquitoes <laughs> already this spring. That's okay. It's summertime. Soon. Better, better than army worms. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. For Julie and the crew at Albanac North, I'm Dennis Anderson. Have a great weekend, everybody. Good night, everyone, and be kind.